says, Behold, I'm doing new things. That was part one, and today we want to talk about part two of giving you a little bit more of the context and a little bit more of the insight of what God is able to do and how he goes about doing it. In your bulletin, there is uh, an insert, and there's an outline. It uh, can help you follow along if you would like. In the introduction, I wrote the whole book of Isaiah is all about warning and redemption. If you look at the whole book of Isaiah, it's always talking about the prophet warning the people of God that they are going astray, and then a sense of, as they go astray, a sense of redemption where God wants to forgive them and bring them back uh, to him or to himself. Grace, if I were to use one word uh, to describe the book of Isaiah, grace would be that word. Uh, it helps us understand who God is, that uh, if it weren't for grace, none of us would be able to stand here today. As I was reading in that particular chapter, which I think is a very relevant chapter, chapter 43, uh, Isaiah has a lot of wonderful passages, and I use uh, some of them for my own comfort and to comfort others. As I was reading through this particular chapter 43, I was struck by verses 21 and 22, and I will sort of develop that a little bit more in a, while, in a little while here. It says, the people whom I form for myself will declare my praise. The people whom I form for myself will declare my, my praise. God has formed his people for a purpose, uh, to declare his praise. And then it goes on to the next verse and says, yet you have not called on me, O Jacob. You have become weary of me, O Israel. When he talks about Jacob, it's the same, same name for Israel. It's the people of Israel that God is referring to. And uh, God's saying, I'm gonna, I want to use you to, to make you something that will praise me. And I'm waiting for you to actually call upon me. And he says, yet you have not called on me. So I want to talk today about three different reminders that we need to be aware of. The, the first reminder is the reminder of God's promises. God has made certain promises. And as we think about promises, we often think about good promises, positive promises. But with God, there's also that sense of there are some negative consequences, some punishment that are part of the promises of God. And we need to be aware of those as well. So as we think about this, the first point there is God's wrath that we, we often do not want to talk about because we don't want to see God as a as a wrathful God, the one that can punish. But I want you to hear the prophet as he's talking on behalf of God in verse 14 of Isaiah 42. Some harsh words. He says, I have kept silent for a long time. I have kept still and restrained myself. Now, like a woman in labor, I will groan, I will both gasp and pant. You know, verse 24 says, Who gave Jacob up for spoil and Israel to plunderers? Was it not the Lord against whom we have sinned? And in whose ways they, they were not willing to walk? And whose law they did not obey? Verse 25, So he poured out on him the heat of his anger and the fierceness of battle. And it set him aflame all around, yet he did not recognize it. And it burdened him, but he paid no attention. A point is being made here from the prophet in verse 24. It's saying here that God is the one that caused Israel to go through the pain that it was, it, they were going through. It didn't happen by accident. It, it's not something that, well, God was looking away and they attacked his people. No, God put them in that place where they would be plundered. They would be attacked and defeated. Again, verse 24 says, Who gave Jacob or Israel for, for spoil and Israel to plunderers? Was it not the Lord against whom we have sinned? And so we need to be aware of the fact that when we sin, there are consequences. And God, again, in verse 14, the, the, the prophet says, I have kept silent for a long time. I have restrained myself. 
And as a parent, sometimes you can probably identify with that, where the children are just sort of, sort of going all over the place, and you restrain yourself from disciplining them. But the time comes when you say, enough is enough. And God does the same thing with us. But verse 25 is a little disturbing. It says, so he poured out on him, meaning on Israel, the heat of his anger and the fierceness of battle. And he set him a flame all around, yet he did not recognize it. In other words, God, the prophet is saying, God has sort of punished Israel in such a powerful way, such a deep way, but Israel is not recognizing it. They have become so dull in their spirits that they go through all this pain and, and grief and sorrow and all these things, and they've gotten to a place now they've become accustomed to it. That they're not even recognizing that God is trying to get their attention. And I ask, I, I, I ask ourselves the question, isn't that where we are sometimes spiritually? We have gone so far. We have suffered so much of the consequences of our sins that we have become comfortable without pain. We have become comfortable without dysfunctionality. We're not looking at what we're going through and saying, is God trying to get my attention? And that's a sad place to be. And yet that's a place where a lot of people are. They've gotten so accustomed to the pain and the dysfunction that they think that's the normal thing. When God is trying to get their attention saying, you, are, you have fear from the way that I've shown you. And you need to turn around. So part of God's promises is his wrath. He will eventually punish us, discipline us, because he considers us his children. So the next one is, again, a reminder of God's redemption. In Isaiah 43, a passage that we read often to people that go through difficult, difficult times, and uh, even when I'm going through a difficult time, I focus on this particular passage. It says, But now, thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob. Now I want you to see how the tone changes. And he who formed you, Israel. He says, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. For you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I have given Egypt as your as ransom. Cush and Siva in your place, since you are precious in my sight. Since you are honored and I love you, I will give other men in your place and other peoples in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring you offsprings from the east and gather you from the west. God as much as he is displeased with his people, he constantly still reminds them how much he loves them. Constantly reminds them that when they go through a difficult time, he is with them. Right? So when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you go through fire, you will not be scorched. Why? Because I am with you. And sometimes as we go through the difficulties of our lives, we forget that God has promised that he's there with us. And we need to trust him on that. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. God knows exactly who you are. God knows exactly what you're going through. God knows exactly what you need. And God wants to give it to you. And to me, if we could only pause and refocus our attention on him, because he constantly reminds us how much he loves us. Thirdly, we talk about God's purpose for redemption. So we have 
sin we have walked away. God has redeemed us. He's called us back. And, and, and why did he do that? Why is God so concerned to redeem us from all the sins of our lives? Isaiah 43, verse 10 and 11 says this, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord. Why is God doing this? Because God said, you, as I redeem you, as I take you from, from the pit of your sins, from the destruction, as I, as I pick you up from that and put you on a solid ground, on a solid rock, I want you to become now my witnesses. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he, before me there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and there is no Savior beside me. God is trying to help his people understand. I am God. I'm the one who created you. I'm the one that has you in the palm of my hand. I'm the one that wants to take care of you. I want you to be my witness. Basically saying, I want you to be, to be so full of God, so full of the Spirit, that when you go anywhere, people begin to look at you and say, Why, wow, there's something different about you. What is that? And that's when you become God's witness. You say, well, it is because of God. It's what God has done in my life. Even in the midst of pain and, and trials and tribulation and grief and losses and all those things, God was still there. Because it's not just about the good times, it's about experiencing God in a very difficult time as well that makes us a witness. Witness is that sense of transformation that takes place in our lives. Jesus said, for instance, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. When you follow me, you'll be able to make a difference in the world. And in the book of Acts, Peter and John, as they were going to the temple, they found a beggar that asked him for money. And he said to the beggar, you know, we don't have any money, but what we have, we give you. In the name of Jesus, be healed. And the beggar was a lame person. Uh, he was healed. And when the people, the, the scribes and the Pharisees and, and, and all those religious leaders, when they saw that, they got concerned that these people are able to do this. And they put them in jail. And then they released them. And then threatened them. Says, don't ever talk about this name again. But it was interesting because the verse says, now they observed these men, Peter and, and John, that they had a sense of confidence. And then they remembered, yeah, these men were with Jesus. There's something wonderful and powerful about your presence and my presence when we are full of God. Not full of ourselves, but full of God. There's something that comes out. It just oozes out of us and it helps us to stay confident in the, in the midst of whatever comes our way. And one of the things that I shared earlier in the service is that whole sense of one of my convictions is that God is my God. God is on my side. And I said to the people, because sometimes, you know, I've been warned a few times. Not everybody thinks like me. I be careful. You know, people sometimes want to harm you. And I, and I literally say, I pity the person that will try to harm me just because they don't like me for no reason at all. Because I am a child of God, and if you do that to me, my conviction is that my Father will vindicate me. Yeah. And my Father will protect me and take care of me. And I'd pity you yeah. if you did that. That's the kind of conviction where you have that God is with you. 100%. That's the beauty about being a Christian. That loves God and trying to walk with God every single day. None of us are perfect. God is not even looking for perfection. But he's looking for people that, are, that want to seek him. The second reminder that I want to talk about is the reminder of God's power. God reminds his people he will destroy those who try to destroy them. 
In verses 14 and 15, he says, Thus says the Lord your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, For your sake I have sent them to Babylon. I will bring them all down as fugitives, even as the Chaldeans, into the ships in which they rejoice. I am the Lord your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I said to you that it is God who allows the people of Israel to be plundered, to be defeated. But at the same time, God is saying, I pity those people that are going to defeat you, because I will punish them. And this is the promise from God that God, He is going to destroy those who try to destroy His children. God reminds his people how he destroyed the Egyptians, for instance. In verse 17, he alludes to that. He says, who brings forth the chariot and, and the horse, the army and the mighty men. They will lie down together and not rise again. They have been quenched and extinguished like a wick. Now, last week we talked a little bit about the story of Ex the Exodus, when the people of God were finally released from their bondage in Egypt. And they're making their way to the promised land. And as they were going to the promised land, uh, they faced the Red Sea. As they faced the Red Sea, they couldn't, go, they couldn't go further. And then all of a sudden, they start hearing in the background this noise of chariots and horses and army of uh, Pharaoh behind trying to come and destroy them. To the point that I made the point to you last week, that some of them said, we should have stayed in Egypt. We should have stayed in slavery. We should have served them, even though they blasphemed our God. Because at least that was comfortable. Now we're going to die, because there's an obstacle before them. And God did something wonderful when he opened up the Red Sea. And the people of Israel walked through. And when the army of Pharaoh came, the sea closed back down, and they drowned. And this is the illusion to that. That God was going to take care of all those who will come after them. God reminds his people, and this is really important, not to pigeonhole him. God reminds us not to pigeonhole him. Verse 18 says, do not call to mind the former things or ponder the things of the past. And that's part of our verse of the year. But the thing is, we have to realize that some of us think we have figured God out. So we, we think that God is going to do the same thing today that he did yesterday. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's a given. But what God is going to do today is going to be different than what he did yesterday. Or he's going to do the same thing in a different way. His power and faithfulness is the same. But how he displays it, we'll talk about that in a little bit, it can be different. So my, my uh, message for you today, as you leave, whatever you're going to take with you, is this one thing here. That God is going, to do, is going to do something new in your life this year. But be open to his creative way. Because he's not going to do it like he did yesterday necessarily. And, and he's going to show the people of Israel, you know, at one point, the problem was the sea. And I'm going to show you something different. So let's not think that we have figured God out. You know, with God, all things are possible. We believe that. But so many of us, every time we confront something that's difficult to bear in our lives, we throw our hands in the air and say, my goodness, I don't know what we're going to do now. We forget what God did yesterday. We forget that God took care of us yesterday. And that he promises that he's going to continue to take care of, of, of us. But he's going to do it in a different way. And so be open to how God is going to work in your life. God is predictable in, in, in the fact that he's faithful and powerful. But he's very unpredictable in how he's going to demonstrate that power and that faithfulness in each of our lives. So the reminder that we have here is a reminder of God's versatility. The third reminder is this. His versatility. We are very finite, and we, un we underestimate God's power. 
Verse 19, the beginning of verse 19 says, Behold, I will do something new. Meaning, I will express my power in a different way. I will express my faithfulness in a different way. But, so what was the people's challenge in front of the Red Sea? The people's challenge in front of the Red Sea is which up. You know, it was either we're going to, you know, God, God's going to do something, or we hope he's going to do something. Some of them had given up already, saying, you know, we wish we stayed behind and served them. But they, they had this, this, this water, body of water in front of them, they couldn't go anywhere. Maybe they could, some of them thought, maybe we could swim, maybe God can give us the strength to swim. I don't think they thought that way. They just thought they would die. Like most of us, when we face difficulties, we say, that's it, that's the end. We're done. We don't, we, we underestimate God's versatility, how he's going to move. So, God said he's going to do something new. So what was the next thing he was going to do? So the first challenge was the Red Sea. Water blocked them from getting to the promised land. The next part here, verse 19 and 21, uh, at verse 221, it says this, Behold, I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? I will even make a roadway in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. The beasts of the field will glorify me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I have given water in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my chosen people. And verse 21 says, The people whom I form for myself will declare my praise. Now, again, this, this, the interesting thing here is this God was ready to blow their minds, right? The first time was the water that was blocking them. He opened the water and they walked on dry land. Now, they went to the promised land, the next thing they faced is what? The wilderness. So they think they're going to die in the wilderness because there's no water. And what does God say? He switches it over now. Instead of opening the water so they can walk on dry land, he brings water into the dry land. See, God is doing the same miracle. They thought they were done because they were in the desert. Because the last time God opened the water, so all they have in mind is, well, God opened the water. That's great, but now we have this desert. And God says he will spring forth uh, rivers, make a roadway in the wilderness, even the beast will glorify him. But one of the things that caught my attention is this. In verse 19, it says, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it will, it will spring forth. Will you be aware of it? Will you be aware of it? And my position is that God is doing great things every single day all around us. And the majority of us can't see it. <clears throat> now I'm going to say something that uh, will challenge us a little bit. Because the reason I believe we can't see what God is doing is because we're too busy complaining. Remember last week I talked to you and I shared with you how, how Moses says that God is going to deliver us. Just keep silent. Because all that grumbling. Will you be aware of what God is doing? Some of us complain way too much. And in the process of complaining, your mind is in a different place. And you're focused on problems. And you overlook all the miracles that God has done and is doing in your life today. As I was getting ready this morning and shaving, looking in the mirror, the story of 9-11 uh, came to mind where one of the wives of the, one of the pilots was recounting the story and he said how that day started as any other day. He got up, he got ready, kissed her goodbye, went to work. He's a co-pilot of Flight 11, I believe it is, which is the first plane that he was created. And I'm thinking, you know, sometimes we get up, we don't think about the fact that God thank you for waking me up because some people didn't get up. We go back home, we don't even think about it, that, hey, God brought us home. 
Because you don't know what's ahead with them. You and I are taking for granted that I'm going to get up tomorrow morning, I'm going to go through this day, I'm going to come home. You may not. The fact that you have is a miracle. And we need to begin to change our mindset to be to, to recognize all the things that God is doing in our lives. The only way we can do that is by stopping all the complaining that we do all the time. Somebody said it and put it well and said, have you prayed about it as much as you complained about it? Because there's something that feels good about complaining. And if you can get an ear or two, or three, or four, or five, I mean, you'll be complaining all day long. But have you prayed about it as much as you're complaining about it? Because when we continue to complain, we will not be aware of the miracles that God is doing in our lives. And that's going to be our challenge. To stop complaining and stop praying. Because whatever it is, if it's the water that's in front of you, God can open the water. If it's a mountain that's in front of you, God can lower that mountain into the sea. If it's the wilderness that you're facing, God can bring water in the wilderness. It doesn't matter what it is, God is able to do something in your life. If you would just begin to pay attention to what he's doing. And again, the question he asked was this, will you not be aware of it? All these things you're about to do. Will that just escape you completely? I hope it doesn't. I hope this year, as you begin the new year, that you have a new mentality that God is good and powerful and He's going to do some new things in different ways. So don't pigeonhole Him. Allow Him to exercise His versatility, His creativity in helping you solve whatever problem you're facing today. Now, what are our greatest challenges? Because God is faithful. He's, he's doing all these things. He has redeemed the people of God. He has redeemed us. He has forgiven us. What, what are our greatest challenges? I want to list five for you. Okay? The first one is we lack faith. The basic problem is we lack faith. Because if we're complaining a lot, we're not exercising faith. So I want you to think about your own life and your own attitude towards life. If you're complaining too much, you are demonstrating that you lack faith. I'm not saying that sometimes when I'm concerned about certain things. But again, keep in mind, are you praying about it as much as you're complaining about it? We lack faith. Verse 22, verse, the first part of verse 22 says, Yet you have not called on me. God saying, I'm going to make you my witnesses. I'm going to show you some great things, some new things. I'm going to make you my witnesses. What does that mean? That means I'm going to do something in you that's going to be so incredible that people are going to say, hey, you look different, you sound different, you act differently. Uh, what happened to you? And you say, God has done the new thing in my life. That's the witness. But then, he says here, yet you have not called on me. We have complained and complained and complained, and we have not called on God. And I want to encourage you. The Bible says that God invites us to pray. It says if we call upon him, he will hear us, he will answer us, and he will show us what? Great and mighty things which we have not yet seen. That's the promise of God. Secondly, we lack fervor. We lack fervor. The same verse 22 says, Yet you have not called on me, O Jacob, but you have become weary of me. You have become weary of me. And isn't it where we are as a country, as Christians? We have become weary of God. We have become very indifferent about God. It's almost like God does not matter anymore. <coughs> God just doesn't matter anymore. To so many people, and unfortunately even for some Christians, God doesn't matter anymore. It's almost like God has become irrelevant in our lives. 
And this is exactly what was happening with the people of Israel. They lacked fervor. They became weary of God. Number three, we lack forethought. We lack forethought. Now, what is forethought? Forethought is thinking in advance how we can honor, how we can appreciate, uh, how we can please somebody because of what they've done. Somebody has done something nice to you, and you need to think, how can I express my gratitude to this person? That's forethought. And after all that God had done for the people of Israel, they should have tried to figure out, you know, God's been good to us. We have sinned, we have messed up, He's forgiven us. How can we repay Him in some ways? Well, God says, just to be obedient. God be good enough. Look at verse 23 and 24. It says, you have not brought to me the sheep of your burnt offerings. You have not honored me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with offerings, nor wearied you with incense. You have bought me no sweet cane with money, nor have you filled me with the fat of your sacrifice. God said, you haven't done any of these things. After all that I have done for you, you haven't done any of these things. No forethought in how to try to please God. And, and the question that came to my mind as I thought about it is yesterday as we talked about the meeting uh, that we had, we talked about every ministry. If you're part of a ministry, that is your act of worship. So therefore, take it seriously. So I thought about it. When we go to church on Sunday morning like we are today, when we, when we get ready to come to church, what is it that's going through our hearts and minds? Is it that I'm going to fulfill the duty? Is it that this is something good to do on a Sunday morning? Or is it an act of worship? Is it sort of a forethought, God, you've been so good to me all week long? I want to go and worship with the rest of my brothers and sisters. I want to bring you worship. A lot of times, we just run into church. We just want to make it because it's become a good habit to be in church. But has it become an act of worship? Is there forethought in preparation? Because if there's forethought in preparation to come to church on Sunday, guess what, on Saturday night? You would stay up late. On Saturday night, you would not be doing things that would sort of get into your mind to distract you. So often we go to church on Sunday morning and they are really tired. They are yawning. Not because of the sermon, because the sermon is good. <laughs> right? And, they, they, and, and I don't think you personally if you yawn. I just know you've been up late on Saturday night. <laughs> right? But if there's forethought, then you prepare for it. If you are going to take a serious exam on Sunday morning, would you go to bed earlier on Saturday night? Would you maybe sort of recap the thing that you're studying about and prepare yourself so when you get to take the exam or whatever it is, you are fully rested, focused on what you're going to do? That's forethought. That means you're coming together here as an act of worship. And that's what God is looking for. And when we don't do any of these things here, the end result is we fail God. We fail God. Verse 24, the second part of it says, You have bought me no sweet cane with money, nor have you filled me with the fat of your sacrifices. Rather, you have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. The inevitable conclusion of us not having faith, not having fervor, not having forethought is sin. Because if we have faith, if we were excited about who God is in our lives, 
If we had the sense of forethought, then we would think twice before we sin. The reason we sin is because God is not quite in the center of our lives, of our thoughts. And therefore, the temptation comes and we just sort of yield to it. And then, oh man, why did I do that? We're not focused. There's no forethought. There's no fervor. There's little faith. And I want to encourage you to change that paradigm. Last point is, we fortunately find forgiveness in God. And this is the beauty of God in the end of the book of Isaiah, that sense of redemption. Verse 25 says, I, even I, am the one who wipes out their transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember their sins. In, in Psalm 103, verse 12 says, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far I have cast out your sins. And I will remember them no more. We serve a God that really loves us. And I want you to be able to think about this. Recognize how much he actually loves you. And begin to see that he is going to do a new thing. And that meeting is going to look different than what he's done in the past. Be open to God's creative ways. Again, in Isaiah 55, it says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heaven is higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Trust that God is much bigger than what you think, and that he wants to do something incredible in your life that you and I need to draw closer to him and watch him do this incredible thing that he wants to do in our lives. And let's be open to how he does that. Let's not tell him how he should be doing it. Let's be open to how he wants to do it. Let us bow. I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this message. If the Spirit of God has moved you to the place where you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, we want to encourage you to say this brief prayer. Simply just say, Dear God, I thank you for loving me. I thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on a cross for my sins. I recognize that I am a sinner in need of forgiveness and salvation. So I pray, forgive me my sins, cleanse me, make me a child of God, and help me from this day forward to live a life that will be pleasing in your sight. If you have said this prayer, we invite you to email us at welcome at mhcbcimpact.org, or you can call us at the office 401-454-0052. Again, thank you for being with us. God bless you. Thank you for listening to today's sermon. This has been a production of Mount Hope Community Baptist Church located in Providence, Rhode Island. Learn more by visiting our website, mhcbcimpact.org. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter, mhcbcimpact.